Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Well, good morning. It is so good to be here at Calvary once again. It's a delight and a privilege to, uh, to be asked to share in this pastor appreciation service. Before we go any further, I'd like to introduce my, my wife, my life partner, my partner in ministry. This is Robin. Would you welcome Robin this morning? 42 years in ministry. It's hard to believe because we're only 45. So uh, we've been doing this since a very early age. Thank you, Pastor Ryan, Rachel. Thank you for having us this morning. It's a, it's a delight and a privilege to share your platform and to, uh, to have ministry with you all this morning. We are so appreciative of Pastor Ryan and uh, the ministry that he provides. He is a, a personal friend and a colleague, does a great job in our network. He serves our network as a presbyter uh, for those who are under the age of 40, and we so appreciate his, uh, his sincerity, his depth of character, and uh, uh, what he brings to the table at our network makes us better. And so we just so appreciate you. Thank you, Pastor Ron. And on. Unfortunately, uh, the post that he's serving at, he has aged out. <laughs> That's right, man, you're old, all right? Just saying. No, uh, it, he represents those that are under 40, and our threshold is, is if you're in office, when you turn 40, you get the boot. We just kick you to the curb, and you're done. No, that's, that's not. You finish out the term, and then someone will uh, succeed whom, him who is under 40, but uh, uh, we're hoping and looking forward to the time when we just continue to serve in, in uh, uh, leadership uh, together, so love you guys. Appreciate you. This morning we're going to look to 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 23 in a message that uh, I've entitled Healthy Church, Fostering Health in Your Pastor. How many of you want a healthy church? Can I get a good amen? Yeah. If you have a healthy church, there's nothing like it. And if you have an unhealthy church, there's nothing like it. But in order for us to have a healthy church, we need healthy leaders. And this morning, that's going to be the, the, the focus of our message, fostering health in your pastoral team, fostering health in your pastors. I heard this story about a, a young minister. He was in his first pastoral assignment, pastoring a small church at in a, in a community, and he had made friends with the local funeral director, and the, the funeral director uh, asked this young minister, would it be all right if I called upon you when we're conducting a funeral service for a family that does not have a church or a pastor? And the young man said, well, that's a wonderful opportunity. I'd be happy to help you with that. And so that arrangement was made. One Monday, the funeral director uh, called this young minister and said, uh, we have a family who has had a death in their family and uh, they do not have a church or a pastor. Would you mind tomorrow just, just coming to the gravesite? It's going to be a very simple uh, internment service and if you could uh, you know, have a brief service, that would be uh, much appreciated by the family. So the young minister found out where this cemetery was and said he'll be there. It's at 11 o'clock in the morning, 11.30, and uh, uh, it, it was out along some backcountry roads. He'd never been to this particular cemetery before, and uh, a horror of horrors, he got lost. So he, it's, it's 11.30, and he's still looking for this cemetery, 11.40, 11.50, and at, a, at noon, he finally finds the cemetery. He gets there, and there's no one there except for two workers having their lunch. They're sitting on a mound of dirt. And the, the, the young minister feels absolutely horrified that he's made this commitment and broken it. So he goes up to the two fellows eating their lunch, and he said, listen, I was supposed to be here at 11.30. I got lost. 
I've made a commitment. I want to fulfill my commitment, even though everybody's gone. Would you mind? You just go ahead and keep eating your lunch, and I'm going to do this memorial service, and then I'll be on my way. They said it was fine with them. And so uh, he, he just he felt a need to really give it all he had. You know, if, if you're going to make a mistake, let's make up for it. Give it all you've got. And so he has this little funeral service and reads Scripture. He passionately preaches a, a short sermon. He prays, and, and he really sends the departed out in style. About 15 minutes later, he's done. He thanks the guys, and he gets in his car, and he pulls out and goes home. And the one fellow sitting there finishing his lunch looked at the other and said, I've been installing septic systems for 30 years, and I have never seen anything like that. Let's give some context to today's message. If we're going to have a healthy, thriving church, we need to have healthy, thriving ministers. There are advantages that you as a church body will experience by treating your pastors well, by treating them respectfully and and valuing them. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, the author of that book says this, obey those who rule over you. Now, let's pause here because that word rule is a difficult word to swallow. It's really a leadership term. And it's not talking about dictatorial authority. It's talking about leadership. So we could just as easily insert the word, obey those who lead you and be submissive or be cooperative for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. How many of you know one of these days we're all going to show up at Jesus' house? Amen? And the Bible makes it clear to all of us we must all give an account for the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. That's all of us. But for those who are in ministry, there's an additional layer of accountability. And that's what the author of Hebrews is referencing. These who lead must one day give an account to God. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. For if they do this and it gives their soul grief, that doesn't do anybody any good. Isn't that right? That's a loose paraphrase. Uh, The writer says, that would be unprofitable for you. I want this morning to encourage you to view your pastors as commodities. They can be depleted, used up burnout, an an exhausted resource, or they can be replenished, refilled, rejuvenated. That would be a benefit to the body of Christ. Can I get a good amen? There are not many careers, if I can use that term, there are not many careers like that of a pastor. It's a 24-7, 365 deal. They're almost, the pastor's almost always on call. There are exceptions. I was in a jungle in Honduras with no cell signal. I was not on call for a few days. But ministers know that this is not just a call, this is a lifestyle And this call, this lifestyle, embraces our whole family. Our children, our spouse are also involved in the call. And get this, in this career, your boss is God. And someday we give an account to him. So said Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5. And the skill set for 
effective ministry has changed somewhat over the decades. It used to be that you would go to college or seminary and study the Bible and study theology, learn how to teach and preach along with some basic sacerdotal responsibilities like how to baptize or how to lead a communion service or do a baby dedication along with some pastoral care. Today, the requirements have expanded significantly. Today's required skills are much broader along with the core disciplines that I've just, that I've just uh, outlined there is also organizational leadership required. In fact, our ministers today that are doing graduate studies are mostly getting degrees in organizational leadership. It's the number one degree for ministers. Pastors also must be financial experts. They have to have legal acumen. They have to understand Contracting, architecture, codes, facilities, maintenance, and the like. Pastor must also be familiar with HR, human resources. And another key component to a minister's skill set is he has to understand psychology and psychiatry. Because the pastor is going to likely be called upon to do individual counseling, crisis counseling, marital counseling, family counseling, and group counseling. We call that church. <laughs> and for the, matter, for the minister to adequately minister in their community and in their church, they have to be able to recognize diagnosable conditions. I've learned a long time ago, we never know who's coming to church and what they're bringing with them. So many people have experienced trauma, either developmental as they were growing up or life experience trauma. And that trauma manifests itself in so many different ways. Oprah Winfrey co-authored a book with a psychiatrist and the premise of that book was uh, sometimes we ask the question, what's wrong with you? Have you ever asked that question? Not out loud, you say that to yourself. But you, you look at something or someone and the behaviors that are going on, you say, what's wrong with them? And, and the book said a better question to ask is, what happened to you? Wow. And the pastor and the pastors have to be sensitive and aware of a wide variety of diagnoses because people are coming to church with deep needs, hurts, addictions. We call church a hospital for the hurting, amen? It is a hospital for the hurting. But sometimes when people are hurting, they get angry and lash out. They do things that make you wonder what's going on. That's part of this thing we call a call to ministry. The pressure and strain that individuals experience in ministry as a result of this broad skill set that is now required causes another condition that we're familiar with. It's called burnout. I read a study recently that stated that only one in 10 ministers who start out in pastoral ministry will retire in pastoral ministry. That means nine out of 10 will step out, redirect. The New Testament is filled with instructions for ministry and ministers. 
In fact, three of the books of the New Testament are dedicated to that very topic. They're called the pastoral epistles. First and Second Timothy and Titus deal almost exclusively with how to conduct the household of God. There are other passages as well. And these categories, these, these, these texts can be divided into two categories. One is instructions to ministers on how to do ministry. And the other category is written to the church body on how to receive church ministry. Very interesting. And so this morning we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. Would you turn there with me if you have your Bibles this morning? 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 17. Would you kindly stand with me one more time as we honor God's word in its reading? 1 Timothy 5:17. And it says this, let the elders who rule well, lead well, be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder, pastor, except from two or three witnesses, those who are sinning, rebuke, rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest may also fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Father, help us to take your word and just in, incorporate it into our individual lives and into our corporate life as a church, that in all things you would be glorified, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. There are four things that I would like to draw out of this passage of Scripture for your consideration this morning. First is, if we're going to have and foster health in our pastor and in our pastoral team, we need to promote double honor. That's what verse 17 talks about. What are we talking about? We're talking about respect, let the elders who lead well, rule well, be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Now, Paul gives this standard of good ministry as a leadership term, this, this idea of ruling well. It implies administration, delegation, application of biblical standards. How many of you want a biblical church? Absolutely. And so that is part of the pastors and part of the pastoral team's job and responsibility is to know the word, live the word, show the word, teach the word, lead others in the word. Amen? And that's the second Peace is preaching and teaching well. I heard a story about uh, uh, a fellow, he was preaching, and preachers tend to, they get excited about what they're saying, they lose track of that big clock on the back wall, and they just keep going. And this, this one fellow was preaching on a Sunday morning, and he was just ignoring the clock on the wall. How many, how many of you remember, it used to be 12 o'clock was the holy hour of dismissal. 12.01, and you were into overtime. And so he had blown right past the 12 o'clock and blown past 12.15 and was cresting 12.30. And uh, finally, somebody couldn't take it any longer, and a fella in the, in the back took off his shoe and wailed it at the platform. He missed, and he hit a guy in the front row in the back of the head. And the fella fell forward and landed spread eagle on the floor. People automatically, you know, oh, and they ran to take care of him. And the fellow could be heard saying, hit me again, I can still hear him. <laughs> I 
11.55, let's keep marching forward. <laughs> so Paul identifies the standard of good ministry as good leadership and being able to teach, preach, disseminate the word of God, discipling people. And then it's up to the church to respond well to good ministry. Responding well. Unfortunately, some folks feel entitled to be mean, critical, condescending, and disrespectful to a minister because after all, he's a man of God and he's handcuffed from retaliating or responding. Paul dealt with that too. 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul says to Timothy, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to believers in word, conduct, love, spirit, faith, and purity. Why did Paul have to tell Timothy, don't let anyone take advantage of you? It's because people were taking advantage of him. Don't let anyone despise you because you're younger. It was likely because there were some people doing that. Paul also says the same thing to Titus, another young minister. In Titus 2.15, he says, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. How many of you like a good rebuke? <laughs> well, you have problems. <laughs> if you like somebody chastening you, that's a problem. Now, that usually is a, a corrective word. I don't know about you. When somebody corrects me, I usually want to push back, right? I want to self-justify. I want to prove them wrong and me right. Anybody else in the room? And so Paul is saying, hey, look, there's going to be times where you're going to have to exhort. That means lift people up. Rebuke. That means tell people to settle down. Behave yourself with all authority, and then he says, let no one despise you. Here's the deal. If a pastor doesn't behave respectfully, he can't expect to be treated respectfully. But if a pastor doesn't respect themselves, they will not get respect from others. Isn't that true? If you want to have a healthy pastor, you must give them the respect that is due their office, their function. That helps keep things healthy. I was a presbyter in a section in southwestern Pennsylvania. We had about 30 churches that we helped to guide and resource when they needed us. And there was one church that called me and said, there's only 10 or 12 of us left. We want you to come and hold a meeting to close the church. And I said, well, I'll be glad to come, but I'm not coming with the intention of closing, but to see what we can do to move forward in this gospel ministry to which we've been called. So I went and we talked and they were all my elders. I was a young presbyter, just like pastor. I, I was under 40 years old myself. And we, we sat and talked and I said, listen, you're, you're, you're contributing to the church. You're, you've continued to tithe and hold the, you know, keep the doors open. We'll partner with you and get a pastor but your new pastor is probably going to be one of two things. In your condition, this is the way it works. He's either going to be young or he's going to be on the, the, the outgoing side of his ministry career. I mean, that's just the way it's going to work. Okay, we're fine with that. So we brought in a young man and his wife, sweethearts of kids. First ministry assignment. And th these folks chewed them up and spit them out. Critical, mean-spirited. Young man had a nervous breakdown. We relieved him of his responsibility so that he could get well. And then we needed to have another church meeting. And I had the unfortunate task of saying, folks, what you did was wrong. 
the way you treated that young man. And one, one dear sister, she raised her hand. She, st- she stood up and she said, and this is out of the book of Acts. She said, I've been in the way for over 50 years. The way meaning the way of following Jesus. Well, I turned out a little bit. I said, yes, sister, you've been in the way for 50 years. It's time for you to get out of the way. <laughs> and let the church move forward. I said, you folks had the opportunity to be spiritual grandparents to these new kids, and you blew your opportunity. What you did was wrong and mean and unchristlike. We had a come to Jesus kind of a meeting. I didn't win any popularity votes that evening. But we were able to find another minister who would go in and keep that church going. And you know, they were kind of just as mean to him. It's just that he had developed a better sense of, I don't care. I'm here for Jesus. And we'll move the church forward. And they're still open today, thank the Lord. Um, uh, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about honor and respect because that's the Jesus thing to do. Can I get a good amen? amen. And the, the, second, the second area is providing adequate compensation for the minister. Verse 18 says, For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. And it brings everybody in this society, they knew what this meant. An ox treading out the grain would maybe every now and again bend over and eat some of the grain because that sustained him to keep tread. And, and now, uh, pastor, we're called an ox in this. This is, uh, this is you and me. Don't muzzle the ox. The labor is worthy. There's a balance in this, in the scriptures regarding ministers and finances. On the one hand, ministers are not to be greedy for personal gain. The scripture is clear on that. First Peter 5, 2. Peter says to the pastors, shepherd the flock which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, financial gain, but eagerly. You know, sometimes I, I have watched TV and I have watched the televangelists and I'm embarrassed half to death by the way they fleece the flock. It's horrible. And it, and, it, and it troubles my soul because I've got a mansion just over the hilltop, right? Not six mansions across the United States. The Bible's clear that the minister is to watch his want and not be guilty of greed and fleecing the flock. That's on the one hand. And on the other hand, the church needs to be attentive at addressing the financial needs of the pastors. Can I get a good amen? It's just, it's, it's right here. And that's what, it's, that's what Paul is talking about. The labor is worthy of his wages. In other words, when your labor is in church work, then you're going to receive compensation from the church body. Does that seem to make a little bit of sense? I had a fellow came to our church in Uniontown, and he was visiting, and he shook my hand as he was going out the door, and he said, Pastor, my name's Bernie, and... Um, I'm going to start coming to this church. I'm being relocated. My company is relocating me to southwestern Pennsylvania. We're going to move into this community, and I'm going to get involved in this church. Now, forgive me for being a little cynical, but I said to Robin, did you meet Bernie today? Yeah, he's a nice guy. He said, that'll be the last time we see him. He said he's going to come and get involved. Two months later, Bernie moved into our community, and he came in and shamed me for my skepticism. And he became one of the 
best people in my church. Just, just, he just became a close friend. And, and within a year, Bernie was on our board, which is kind of unusual. That's kind of quick. Nobody knew him, and now everybody knows him. And it's because Bernie was the real deal. He loved Jesus, and he loved Jesus' people. And so Bernie's, uh, he's at our first board meeting, and he says, uh, Pastor, can I say something as we get started? <laughs> Here we go. But I trusted Bernie. Yeah, go ahead, Bernie. He said, I just want it to be known that God has put me here to take care of him. And he pointed to me. <laughs> Let me introduce you to Bernie, my best friend. <laughs> and Bernie said, it's my conviction that that man should never want for anything. <laughs> Woohoo! Woo Now listen, Bernie was true, and he wasn't, it wasn't fake, it wasn't pretense, and it wasn't schmoozing. We went through a building program and doubled out our sanctuary, and God was blessing, and we, we thought we'd double it out so we could go to one service, but we were growing so fast we just had to keep with two services, and, and it was wonderful. But the, the building program, it kind of it kind of takes a little bit of takes a little bit out of you. And Bernie pulled us aside one day and he said, uh, we had the whole, the whole board was with him and he said, just want you to know, we're sending you away. We'd like you and Robin to just go get a second honeymoon and be together. We'll take care of your kids and we'll take care of the cost. You pick anywhere you want to go and go. Wow. Wow. Uh, as fate had it, I mean, we just, we, we could only get away for a long weekend with our schedule, but the, the gesture was, was so affirming and it made us feel so cared for. And they paid for it too. I mean, that, that, that went along. <laughs> that made it possible. And, and it, they took care of our kids. And how many of you know, if you want to love your pastor's families, love their kids and grandkids too. Right? All right, we've got to move quickly because that clock is not my friend. Number three. If you want to build health in your pastor and in your pastoral staff, protect their reputation. Verse 19 says, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke, rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. How many of you know our culture in the United States is a culture of accusation? Have you seen any of the commercials about the election? <laughs> oh, Lord, deliver us from evil. Amen. It's, it's what we do. And in this political climate, you throw mud at each other. You throw bricks at each other. You throw lies at each other. And we all just shrug our shoulders and say, well, that's the way you do politics. Would you agree with me that that spirit would never come into this house? That is not how Jesus people treat one another, whether they are pastors or parishioners. It doesn't matter. That is not the way God would have us behave ourselves. And yet it does creep in, and believe me, I get a front row seat to it. There's a scriptural balance to be found here, too. 
It's two part in this verse 19. Do not accept an unfounded, and put that in parentheses because the word's not in the Greek, but it's in the intent. Do not receive unfounded accusations against ministers. So that's one side of it. But if there are two or three people saying the same thing, it needs to be explored. Am I right? That's what it's talking about. It's imperative that you as a church body protect your pastors and their reputation. Because today, folks, you know what? It only takes an accusation to torpedo someone's reputation. You know if it's on Facebook, it's true. (laughs) You know if it's on the news, it's true. Even if they say it's been fact-checked, I want to know who's facts and who's checking it. It's our culture. Let it not come in the room. Do it right. A fellow by the name of Jay Alford shared this story. He was a pastor in Youngstown, Ohio. Had an individual come on his board and say, In the first meeting, it was his first meeting, and he said, I want to say something. He said, I've just, I just feel like I've been elected to this position to vote no on everything. That's a party killer. And fortunately, Jay had discipled his leaders well. He didn't have to deal with it pastor. He didn't have to be the one. One of the senior most board members, an elder in experience and maturity, took the man aside after the meeting and said, brother, we do not conduct ourselves in here like that. You will either need to change your methods or change your position. But we will not be doing that here. Took care of the problem. Protect your pastors. Protect their reputation. If you see them do something that seems wonky or out of of character, go to them and talk to them about it. Number four, I have two minutes. (laughs) Understand your pastors have physical and emotional limitations. Can I get a good amen? amen? Now listen, we know your pastor is a man of God. He walks on water. I've learned how to walk on water. It's a personal gift. It's February, the pond is frozen. That's how I get to walk on water. Paul said to Timothy, no longer drink water only. Take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Why did Paul need to tell him? Because that's, what, that's obviously what Timothy was doing. He was only drinking water. And I'm inclined to believe from doing a character sketch of Timothy that he had an anxiety issue. He had a nervous stomach. And we see, we see evidence of it in Paul's correspondence to Timothy. And so... Paul says, use wine medicinally. Now listen, they didn't have the medicines that we have today. So it was a good, it was a good prescription. But Paul was acknowledging, Timothy, you kind of get nervous, buddy. And it's upset your stomach. You need a little help there. How many of you know your pastors are human? Flesh and blood. That's right. And so they, they, need, they need to practice self-care and they need you to practice family care, congregational care. Let me give you four things to do that'll help. 
Number one, give your pastors grace. They're, they're just human after all. They might forget something. And when it's personal, it feels personal. Give them some grace. Number two, give them information. Sometimes there's this unspoken assumption, if they loved me, they would know. How many of that know that doesn't even work at your house? Right? You got to talk. You have to communicate. You have to share. And I, I, had a, I had a woman, we were greeting and people were leaving and, you know, you shake 100 hands, 200 hands as people were going. And she said to me just as she was leaving, hey, mom's in the hospital. Could you stop by and visit her? Absolutely. And then the next person and the next and so forth. And you know what happened. Monday came and I forgot. Tuesday came. It still hadn't occurred to me. Tuesday afternoon, she called and said, hey, I'm so sorry. Listen to, this. Listen to how she said this. I'm so sorry. You were busy and greeting everybody, and I threw this at you as I was going out the door, and you probably forgot. Isn't that gracious? But, and as soon as she said it, my, my mind's going, ah, oh, I forgot. She said, could you, could you swing by and visit, Mom? Absolutely. You don't have to do it right away. She'll be in the hospital for a couple more days, but I just, I know she'd appreciate you stopping by. You know what she did? She blessed me with information and she blessed me with grace. Thirdly, give your pastors help. How many of you would agree that help is a good thing? Raise your hand. Okay, pastor, take a quick picture. This is, these are all your volunteers. You know they can't do it all. It's development and, and delegation and teamwork that really moves the gospel forward in a community such as this. Give them help. And number four, finally, give them a break. Give them a break. Make, I, I, I said this in first service and I'm going to do it again. Board members, if you're in the service, would you raise your hand? Where are board members? Okay. And I'm going to kindly ask the board to make sure, hold accountable the pastoral team that they take their day off, that they take their full vacation and I have no insider information. I don't know what the rhythms are, but my goodness sakes, when you're on call and you're responsible and, you know, Christmas and Easter and holidays and outreaches and all church functions, um, sometimes you just need a couple extra days off too. You will steward, you will increase the shelf life of your pastoral staff just by saying, Pastor, put it on the agenda for your next board meeting. Did you take your vacation last quarter? When was the last time you took, hey, when's the last time you took two weeks off in a row? Let me tell you what, I, I learned this too late in ministerial life. And now it's, it's 12, 19, I'm going to one. Uh, It takes, it takes three days to decompress. And that's if the kids aren't in the car. <laughs> and then you're on vacation. It takes three days to decompress to where you actually start to feel relaxed. And then it, a day before your vacation is over, you're packing in your brain. You're getting ready for the rhythms. So your one week's vacation has been reduced to three days max. But if you take two weeks in a row, you get 10 days off. Take care of your pastor. Take care of your pastors. Keep them in good health. Amen. Yeah. And you, you may be here today and you say, what about me? <laughs> well, let's talk about that. How healthy are you? How is it with your soul? Are you in a good place 
physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, relationally. If you're here today and you say, you know what, Pastor, I'm not in a good place. I was kind of hoping I'd come to church today and maybe get there. This moment's for you then. If you're here today and you say, I need, I need a health checkup. I don't know God. I don't know Jesus. I want him in my life. I want him in my heart. I need something other than what I've got. Would you pray with me? And the answer is yes. In just a moment, we're going to invite you to slip your hand up, to pray a prayer, to invite the Lord into your heart and into your life. He'll change your life, but it'll be for the better. Because he's promised that he would give us life now and life then. Life here and life in eternity. Would you bow and pray with me, Lord? In the name of Jesus, touch hearts right now. If there are those that are not close to you, those that are far from you, I pray that this would be their moment to connect with you. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and no one's looking around, but we're just honoring one another in this moment of invitation. If you're here today and you say, you know what, Pastor, that's me. There's a hole in my heart. There's an empty spot. And I, I need God. I need him in my life. Would you, would you please include me in that prayer to invite the Lord into my life? Here's my hand. Pray with me. Would you slip your hand up? And we'll pray with you. Yes, hands going up all over. God bless you, each one. God bless you. You may put your hand down. Lord bless you. Are there any others? Here's my hand, Pastor. This is, this is something I need. Please pray with me. Is there anyone else? Yeah, God bless you in the back. We're going to pray with you too. God bless you up front here. Yep, yep, in the back. I see your hand. We're going to pray with you. God knows your need. He knows. Those of you who raised your hand or you wished you to have raised your hand, can we just, just uh, while everyone else's head's bowed and eyes closed, if, if we could just make eye contact for a second. I'm so glad you raised your hand. God knows your need. We're going to pray about that right now. My words, that's not the deal. It's your heart. It's your faith in God right now that's going to make the difference. Please pray this prayer out loud with us, and everyone in the room is going to be praying it. All right? Here we go. Congregation, would you join us? Dear Lord, I confess there have been times in my life I did things that were wrong. I sinned. I knew better. Did it anyway. Please forgive me. Take my sins away. Come into my life. I need you. I want you, I receive you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.